The Time Traveller's Wife was first a 2003 novel, but after that it was a 2009 film and a 2022 TV show. These three versions of The Time Traveller's Wife have the same characters, they have the same premise, they have the same basic story, but are all really quite different. The 2022 TV show from Stephen Moffat covered the first half of the novel with smatterings of material and ideas from the second half in there as well, whereas this film covers the whole novel in its own way. So, after having done a discussion for each episode of Moffat's TV adaptation, we're now going to discuss the 2009 film, and so we will be discussing the actual events from the film, so by nature of that, we will be discussing events that occur both in the novel and in the TV show as well. So, we will be discussing specific changes between the book, film and show. We won't get into too much outright detail with things unique to the book, at least in the sense that we won't outright describe what the book's unique ending is in comparison with the film, we'll just say that it is different. But we generally will talk pretty freely about things the TV show did differently than the film in adapting the novel. So we will get more specific about things the television show did. You don't have to have watched the TV show to listen to this, but we will be openly comparing specific changes between this film and the TV show. So doing all that discussing is going to be myself, Neo from Australia, along with my friends Nate from the USA and Oliver from England. We all have a bit of a different history with the Time Traveler's Wife story here. For me, I first read the book, then I watched the film, and then I watched the show across the six weeks it released. Nate, what's your history with the story? How did you come to The Time Traveler's Wife? I saw the movie first. I saw the movie like years and years ago, and I've rewatched it a few times since then. Um, and I've never read the book. And you did watch the TV show. You uh, discussed one of the episodes with us. That was great. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Oliver, what's your history with the story? Um, I read the book off the back of Doctor Who and knowing it was an inspiration for some of my favorite bits of. Mm -hmm. um, and then that was years ago. And then I watched the series as it came out and then the film for this podcast. Yeah, I like that. So we've all got a different angle with how we came to the movie. So I suppose the place to start is, well, Nate, I can intuit the answer from how many times you've seen it, but did you like the film? Yeah, I liked the film. Um, I'm, I'm a real sucker for time travel romances. You know, that's definitely my favorite uh, subgenre of the romance genre. And um, yeah, I liked it. Does that make Rachel McAdams your favorite actress? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> I mean, for sure, for sure. For for the context of romance movies, at least, definitely far and away. What's So she did About Time, uh, that Richard Curtis film, uh, and she did The Time Traveler's Wife, and there's another one, isn't there? She did... Yeah, uh, obviously you're thinking of Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, that's the one, yeah. Time travel in that as well. Time travel main character yeah yeah that's what, what a weird <laughs> little typecasting she found for herself but yeah you like the film that's that's good that's good uh oliver you've seen it the most recently and you've seen it after the show so i think you've got a really unique perspective here what did you think of it yeah i'm gonna be honest seeing it the last of the three reading the book and then seeing the show and then the film didn't do it any favors um yeah. which i don't think is entirely the film's fault i think that the TV show naturally has a lot more room to do interesting stuff with the ideas. And it's less impressive seeing an idea that we spent a whole episode on getting thrown away in one line. Um, but it, it, it works mostly as a film. Um, yeah. I think there's some bits which are solidly better than the show, but overall I wasn't massively impressed. I was amused today because I rewatched the film today and it hit up to the wedding and it started doing the wedding hijinks that, you know, were the finale of the show. And I looked at the runtime and we're 40 minutes into the film. So we're not even halfway and we're at like the finale of the show. Uh, the movie's kind of on fast forward uh, for the book and, you know, for the aspects that the show is adapting as well, which I think is interesting. It's got its own speed to it uh, that I think works for some of it. Um, the ending... I feel a little like whiplash with how quickly it's throwing things around, but there's a kind of joy to how um, bam, 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 it goes through stuff, I guess. Even apart from being an adaptation, just as a romance film, it's got a very particular pace that films don't tend to go at, which is quite interesting. Yeah. The fact that it does this whole relationship at sort of one speed, but a really fast speed all the way through. I think there's a particular 
type of pacing you get with book adaptations. Not all of them, but the ones... There's a type of book adaptation. Uh, what's it? The first two Harry Potter films are good examples where you can really feel they're looking at the book and they're like going, so we'll put this scene in, then we'll put that scene in, then we'll put this scene in. And it's kind of the, adapt- the adapting is more what scenes do we use and what scenes don't we use compared to something like uh, the TV show version of this where it's like, how do we change all this stuff, you know, to fit being a TV show? Some film adaptations are more like, well, we can't fit all the scenes in because it's a movie. We only have so much time. But what scenes can we put in pretty uh, cleanly? And I think there's a certain type of pacing you get where you kind of, even as you're watching a film, there's some films I watch and as I'm watching them, I go, this is an adaptation of a book. Even if I didn't know beforehand, you can just kind of feel it. There's a certain type of pacing and approach to scenes. I think you can feel in that. And I mean, I, I knew this was based on a book, of course, but I think it really has that type of pacing of we're doing these iconic scenes, you know, in this row. And we can sort of hear all that from the horse's mouth because one of the special features of the film uh, has the director and has the writer talk about how they approached adapting the novel. And the director's approach is pretty much what I was intuiting there, exactly. (laughs) Although the writer massages it a bit. Anyway, let's take a listen to what they have to say. The first thing I did is a cut and paste of the book and I literally went through the pages and, um, and kept what I thought you know, had dealt with the themes that I wanted to deal with. And sort of our guiding principle were the themes. And I'd extracted the scenes that immediately had to do with the love story, which was the most intriguing part in the novel to me. It's what I responded most deeply to. And it's also what draws people to the book, you know. And that allowed me to essentially read an edited version of the text and see whether it could stand on its own or not. Robert showed me the cut-up, and I found it a little bit complicating for me. It didn't have exactly the flow that I thought we needed to have, but it suggested that he and I were aiming in the same direction, and I think that's what was important. And then, you know, the only way to show him my cut-up, if you will, was to write it. Books are an interesting in-between in that they're more episodic than films, generally speaking, um, but not as episodic as TV shows tend to be. Which means the adaptation, like in this case, can go either way and really lean into the episodicness like the TV show does, which is basically an episodic TV show. Or it really leans into the serial stuff and irons out more of the episodic stuff like the film does. I think um, the bit that really got me was the, the, the lipstick in Henry's apartment on their first date. Yeah. The, in the TV show is, like that's the drama for a full episode <laughs> that issue and that drives loads of stuff going forwards and in the film it's oh no don't worry about it and we actually move on another example of that is at the wedding uh claire finds the henry she's getting married to actually being the older henry she seems to just be kind of oh you you know it's just kind of amused by <laughs> it whereas that's so much of the tension and drama in the show's finale is based around really interrogating, well, how would they both feel about that? But in the movie, it's just like, you know, and then they they move on. Uh, yeah, it's it's funny the bits they'll play just kind of... There's, there's drama in the movie still, but it's definitely less... I think part of it's a pacing thing, like how much time it wants to spend on things. And also part of it is the film is interested in a certain tone and the show is interested in a different tone. Uh, I think the film opts for less conflict and more just kind of gooey, you know, joy of the premise and the relationship uh, where it can. And part of that as well is it's a film being made for a wide audience. And so there's going to be stuff the writer and director, you know, fully well like, but they're not going to put in there because they want this to appeal to as many people as they can. Like uh, the writer says so himself. There were big set pieces in the book that I did not choose to play with. I I just just thought that they were interesting in in and of themselves, but not part of the the love story journey. Henry being caught in the cage in the library is an example of that. Or Henry having frostbite and losing his two feet. I thought that was too grand guignol for the particular taste of this movie. I mean, I think it had a very effective element in the storytelling of the novel, but I found having him just be in a wheelchair and not able to walk was fine with me. He didn't have to actually lose his feet. Are you going to have to be in this chair from now on? Only for a little while, honey. Henry visiting himself is a really interesting idea. Henry having sex with himself is a very complicated idea. I liked all that stuff. I thought this gave it a kind of a a breadth and a kind of uniqueness and a kind of honesty that was really compelling, but there was no way for a mass audience that you could put those things in a movie. 
Yeah, I think that if you look at what scenes they... Well, okay, I haven't read the book, so I don't know the full list of what scenes they chose to include versus not include, but I think that they definitely crafted the movie around a particular thematic focus of... I mean, the first time I watched it, I came away thinking, oh, this is about someone who has a... This is a metaphor for critical illness, right? Someone has a condition in this relationship. It's a genetic condition that makes it difficult for them to have kids. And it means that they're away most of the time and can't do and be there for their partner in the way they want to be. And I think that a lot of what they chose to include or not include is all based around that. So it it cracked me up when they had that exchange. I think it was in the bathroom right after the lipstick when he was like, am I competing with the future version of myself? And she was like, no, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> and that was it. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. That is like the drama of the show, like across all six episodes <laughs> is, is that kind of idea. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting. I think also the film, I think it's very interested in what you're saying here, just the kind of idea of a relationship where someone isn't present so much or has difficulty being present for whatever reason. And it's kind of coded like an illness for sure. I think, so in the film, I almost feel the time travel is kind of incidental. Like it's good for a few set pieces and funny kind of ideas for scenes, but the film doesn't feel that interested in the time travel mm-hmm. to me. The way that the novelist, who, who I think is does the most sci-fi interpretation of the three versions, the novelist is really quite interested in you know, what are my rules here? What what are some interesting things I can do? And then, of course, Moffat is so into time travel that he does all kinds of structural uh, things with it. But the film, which I think is totally fair, the film is a romance first. It's like the wife is, you know, the film and time travelers is like in smaller letters, I think, for their approach. And, you know, I can pull up quotes from the special features to that effect. The first one here is from uh, one of the producers, Dee Dee Gardner. Uh, and the second quote's from the director. I just say it's a love story. I, I don't think about the time travel part of it, really. I mean, I know that it's there, and I know that the metaphor that I love about it is there because of the time travel, but I think that what you walk away with after seeing the film is the love story. I can't really have an emotional response to time traveling. <laughs> Mommy! It's a concept that I can sort of rationally approach, or maybe not even rationally, but certainly not emotionally. To me, it was really a metaphor, a very flexible metaphor for a variety of things, one of which is memory how it influences our present. It's also a metaphor for afflictions. How do you make a life around something that sets you apart? It is something that is being done to him, that happens to him, that is an affliction. It's a symptom. He literally dissolves. Yeah, it plays up. I I had that I had that line written down where they sort of shrug off the whole drama of the <laughs> the whole TV show because that's not what it's about. And I, I think you're right, it's very much more framed as an illness than it is in the TV show, which does play that beat, but um, plays it slightly differently. Here it's more about the story of uh, someone who can't stay in one place, and that's the that's the problem. There's not so much non-linearity to it. It's it, the whole show, the whole film goes at, it's the story of their relationship in the order it makes most sense to tell it, it yeah right? exactly it even mm. it opens with the car crash you know it opens the most logical way it could make sense to most viewers which you know makes sense for doing like a big film you want to get the most audience you can but yeah it always it's it's not completely in order of course given what the story is but yeah you're right it's structured in the way that will make most sense to most people i think and unless i'm forgetting something do we ever really see him visiting claire from claire's perspective like in her past, you know, there's a few times where he goes back and it's very clearly meant to be like, okay, at yeah. this point in his timeline, he saw her at this age, even when that would have been super helpful context to have, like yeah. while watching her. And I I know one of the field scenes wasn't even from uh, principal photography. So the film was delayed quite a bit um, because they wanted to get uh, pickup of like a new field scene is my understanding. Uh, but the problem was, you know, the field looks a certain way in different seasons. And so they had to wait for that. And also Eric Banner's hair was non-existent because he just did that J.J. Abrams Star Trek film where he's like a bald uh, bad guy. So they had to wait for the seasons to align again and for Eric Banner's hair to align again before they could film another scene in the field that they decided they needed before releasing the film. So everything was held up 
to do another s- scene in the field and there aren't that many scenes in the field which you know tells me yeah it, the film is just less interested in young claire than the book and the tv show yeah and i know rachel mcadams was a big fan of the book and of claire my love affair began with the book a few years ago and i knew at that time that it was going to be a film so I think I had kind of been dreaming about this character ever since and what it would be like to play her one day if that would if that would be a possibility. So when it came about it was just you know it was just so exciting. It was it was it was something I had been dreaming of for a long time. But I feel like certainly in contrast with the TV show that Claire and the film really suffered here in that like the the film just seems less curious about her to me. Partly it's a runtime thing. The film's quite short. And so if you're focusing just on certain key beats and iconic scenes from the book, that means you're removing a lot of the interior material with Claire. And part of that's a function of who's the most dramatically active character in the book's events. I mean, despite the book arguably focusing more on Claire, she's the title character and everything, it's probably Henry. So, But I just felt a kind of lack of interest in her inner mind for a lot of the film. Like in one of the special features, we're about to hear a clip from the director talks about how he did try to infuse Claire's point of view in some filmmaking aspects, like some scene transitions and colouring for the field scenes with young Claire. But the writer kind of says he abandoned the idea of embedding Claire's point of view in, in the kind of binary switch way, you know, the novel does it between this chapter or this section of the chapter is Claire, this section is Henry. But I feel like in doing that, they kind of scrubbed out her interiority from a lot of the events of the story since they tend to be functionally driven by Henry most of the times in terms of like, this is the literal event happening. You know, this is what is happening in this chapter. It's something to do with, you know, a tangible thing Henry has done. And we do have evidence of a live action version of the book that did find a way to embed, I think, a lot of Claire's interiority into things and not always through like a super formalistic filmmaking method either. But anyway, let's let's take a listen to at first how the writer and then the director phrased this whole kind of idea themselves. The idea that in the book was told from alternating perspectives, Henry's and Claire's telling the story, is something I abandoned in the script. Film kind of gives you two perspectives and allows you opportunities for the characters to express their points of view. And the director is responsible for taking the literary intent and visualize it dramatically. We tried to actually shift point of view in the scenes. We tried to find a cinematic equivalent for that because obviously you can't have a running voiceover in the film and you can't do an inner monologue in film. It's simply not possible. I mean, the worst book in the world can do something that the greatest filmmaker in the world can't, can't do on film. It's just, again, the difference between the mediums. So yeah, there was, of course, an intrinsic challenge here how to solve that. So sometimes it's Henry's scene, sometimes it's seeing it through Claire's eyes, the little girl running through the woods meeting Henry for the first time. It's not a flashback, it's her telling a story. For the purposes of the narrative, we get her idealized version of how that scene unfolded and what happened there. And that's why everything is just pushed a little too far. The red of the blanket is very red. The green of her dress is very green. The pearls of her hair are just a little too perfect. So you're really not looking at a representation of what really happened, but you're looking at her memory. And then we dissolve from the eyes of the little girl to her eyes. And hopefully that signals to the audience that you know that's how she sees him. Anyway, for all that, the film being a film you know, does have certain advantages. It has, like, I can talk a lot about how I think the TV show embedded Claire's actual perspective and inner self into the story more, but there's tangible stuff like when we're in the environments, when we're in, like the director was just describing, that kind of stylized impression of the field, like, constituted from young Claire's perception. I mean, you you look at it and, like... That field looks good, though, doesn't it? Compared to the TV show, the clearing looks great. (laughs) There's so much of the film where I'm just looking at it and thinking, this is gorgeous. Like, the, yeah. they clearly have a budget to realise things without much limits. And just in general, it's a very... I think, you know, it really fits that it's such a gooey romance movie. It's just concerned with it looking good. Like, it's lit very, mm-hmm. like, sexily. Um, the lights are really pretty. Like, it's it's not a realistic type of lighting. It's like, it's like this looks good. You know, this lights our actors in a dark way that, you know, makes them look good. Just in general, it's a really, really pleasant, pretty movie to look at, you know, the whole way through. The TV show, you can see uh, there's 
limitations to the uh to the makeup they use for the different ages there's limitations to how they realize different settings uh you know i love i the tv show is my favorite of the you know the versions but still it, there's a real joy to just watching a film and never having to kind of go oh okay well they couldn't quite realize that you know the way they might have wanted to do they could realize anything they wanted here one thing that i think the tv show did better in terms of special effects was the aging or at least i could tell when someone was meant to be an older version of the character eric banna i i was not able to distinguish between even even the long versus short hair i didn't realize it at first that his hair was a different length um that (laughs) that guy they just can't make him look old that's that's another thing the tv show makes such a huge deal of the haircut the haircut's different in the uh, book to the film as well they all they all play it a little bit differently i like it's it's just a cute little scene in here but it's not even that much different yeah his hair looks good before and it looks good after and and it's not a conscious decision here for him to embrace yeah. a future version of himself. It's I'm getting married, I could do with a haircut. Yeah. Um which, which subtextually is doing the same thing. Um, but it's not in the like drama of the scene. We don't know. It's a conscious thought. Well, yeah, this kind of gets to an issue well, it's worth talking about the acting. So Eric Banner, I really like his version of older. Henry, presidential Henry, as Moffat would say, that Henry that the young Claire looks up to and he's very kind of fatherly and is authoritative in a nice way and he's very gentle, he's very kind of easy to admire and love. I think Eric Banner embodies that super well, this kind of paternalistic but in a nice way. You want to be kind of um, looked after by him. I think he does a great job of that kind of soft uh, masculinity. I think he's really good with that. The younger Henry, you know, the Henry that's supposedly a little bit more on edge, I feel no edge from <laughs> Eric Banner. Yeah. It just feels kind of like a lesser version of the presidential one to me. I think he's so good with that older Henry, but I feel like he doesn't distinguish the young one much at all. So that kind of feels a bit static to me. Yeah, there's I I had a real tro- problem differentiating their ages, both visually and in in the sense of the characters. It, the, the, everyone feels a little bit static, which is the romance genre right yeah it, they're not having massive life-changing revelations about their internal selves they're just getting together um the focus is a lot more on that but they they don't you don't get the sense of them being entirely different people through their relationship in the way you do the tv show yeah i feel like the prickliest he gets in the film isn't even really all the vasectomy stuff for me it feels like in the first restaurant scene where the, for their first date from Henry's perspective, where he just gets a little, whoa, back off. You know, this is a lot. This is too much. And less so in the vasectomy stuff and the miscarriage stuff. Um, he never seemed to get that aggressive, which is like, I really get why this film is the most appealing version of the story uh, to some people. Absolutely. I think it's easier to sink into. Uh, and it's kind of a calmer river uh, to wade in. And I there's also even like the physicality, like there's so much more gooiness even in the way the the characters touch each other i know eric banner has talked about how he wanted to embody loads of physicality uh, into the relationship when i read the script in the book i felt like the most important element here was the relationship between um henry and claire and that was going to be the focus for me there were elements in the book that i felt very strongly about that needed to be present not so much in the written word, but they were very physical things. For example, one of the earliest conversations I had with Rachel in rehearsal was that I just felt like they were completely inseparable physically. That was the, uh, to me, that was like one of the most overriding things I got from, from the book, that they were an extremely intimate couple. And so a lot of times those things can be played without it being written, whether it be how one looks at another person or how one touches someone it does affect the layering of that stuff. But yeah, what about our other lead, Rachel McAdams? Uh, what did you guys think of her performance as Claire? I mean, she's good. It's just kind of remarkable. They don't give her that much to do either. Um, I think she does it well. I think that's the thing. She Compared to the TV show, there's so much less um, from her perspective and to her internal self, which relates back to not being interested in the clearing stuff. I think she. I think Rachel McAdams is doing a very... It's a very likable performance. It's very mannered. Uh, she's putting a lot of quirks and sweetness and specific little endearing mannerisms and things like that. Like she absolutely glows 
at Henry. She does a really good job selling being in love and being enamored. Uh, I, th- I think Rachel McAdams totally succeeds at everything. The film and the film's tone and the film's approach is asking for uh, Claire, but there's it's like an overall thing. But I don't feel that much conflict. Like the she only really gets mildly annoyed when he's gone for two weeks over Christmas and New Year's. Like there's never really, and then you know then they quickly agree not not to really ever argue again. Like in the book, we're in her head, you know, half the time, and in the show, she's quite spiky and arguably more complex so movie claire's a little bit less interesting to me it's just part of the stasis of the film overall and it's kind of a shame to me as someone who really likes the nuances of book and tv claire to get this version which sometimes feels a bit like a sanded down claire or at least a less focused on claire here especially since rachel mcadams was a big fan of the book and she even openly says she thinks spiky like villain characters are more fun to play than up hero ones and stuff like that. I guess tragedy is just kind of delicious. <laughs> it's more fun. It's like it's more fun to play the villain and it's more fun to go through life's ups and downs and watch their love persevere in the end. It's just so satisfying and it hits you at such a deeper level. But yeah, I didn't feel that so much here. And I think the performance is well executed. It's very well executed, but it's kind of of a softer and more passive Claire in a version of the story that just seems generally less interested in Claire anyway, in general. I think a big part of that is the directness of the adaptation um, in the way you talked about where it's it's highlighting the big scenes, the big moments, and um, sort of drawing a line between them to make them work as a film. Uh, rather than, it feels like the TV shows come at it with the dramatic question first, going, this is a relationship where one person's in love with the future version of another person. How does that work? And you don't get the sense of that. I mean, that it, you don't feel like there's a big dramatic question hanging over the film, um, which uh, a lot of romance films don't really do because that's not that's not the genre. But you you don't have that clear sense of scene by scene. This is the issue between these two characters. Yeah, I th- yeah I I really agree because the film. Very early on, one of its first scenes is the restaurant scene. And I know a lot of people were frustrated with how Moffat adapted that scene because, you know, this is so much less enjoyable to watch. It's so much spikier in the show. The film's version of that restaurant scene, their first date from Henry's perspective, is kind of like, you know, he's overwhelmed, but this is more or less her going, yes, I've secured my husband and him going, sweet, you know, I've secured my wife. And that's the start of the movie. So we're you know, where do you go from there? Like, there's a little bit of drama with the miscarriages and then she gets a bit annoyed when he's gone for two weeks. And then, you know, at at the very end, you know, Henry starts expiring and it's sad, but I never, I never really feel like there's much conflict going on here. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a sweet movie to get enveloped in. And I think that's part of the idea, but it does just feel kind of static to me from there on out. It's, um, one bit that jumped out to me was the, the, getting around the vasectomy by getting pregnant with a younger version of Henry, um, which in the uh, in the film, that whole scene of her meeting younger Henry after the vasectomy argument is there to set up how she gets pregnant. Where in the in the TV show, that whole sequence, that's the last episode, their conversation is the whole last episode and then the um the fact that she's going to get pregnant with younger henry is played as the last joke of the of the series um setting up the next one but i feel like that difference where the tv show focuses on that really long conversation between the two of them and it gets drama out of that conversation and and then the the plot stuff of how she ends up getting pregnant is 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 one joke at the end where in the film it feels more like that whole sequence of them meeting in the car is there to get her pregnant because she needs to be pregnant for the next bit of the plot something interesting to me there though was that was one of the cases of the film walking its own walk a bit because in the book my reading of that is it's kind of accidental like the other henry comes in and they have sex and you know they're aware the other henry is on the bed but it's just kind of a sleepy you know sex scene in the show, it's a very premeditated thing. And in the film, it's kind of a halfway house where it's like, you know, they meet in the car and it's a, it feels, I don't feel like it's a product of a big, huge thought out plan, but there is a bit of, 
clear agency in what's going on there, uh, you know, which Henry kind of recognises afterwards. I was interested, that's one of the areas the film does kind of, I think, liven up her character a bit more than how the book played that scene. So that's that was interesting to me. Um, but I see what you're saying about kind of the structure of it in the film's actual story, yeah. Oh, it's worth listening as well to what the director and Rachel McAdams and Eric Banner have to say about the film's take on that, you know, Claire getting pregnant with a younger Henry thing and the kind of conflict or lack thereof in the film of Claire and, you know, the older Henry and a younger Henry as well. Uh, this is what they had to say. What's so fabulous about the novel is that Audrey found symbols and ways to express very interesting psychological insights into people and relationships. When we changed that specific scene, when we shifted its emphasis and made it more about really a transgression on Claire's part, it was just trying to follow this question of, do you like the older Henry better than you like me? And since we zeroed in on, on that conflict uh, in the beginning of the movie, and we come back to it during the wedding, because she in fact gets married to the older version, she knows, it felt like we needed to elaborate a little more and the irony of her cheating on older Henry with the younger Henry, you know, the apples are always redder on the other side of the fence. Where's Henry? Uh, I left him sleeping. I needed some time away from him. I think that she does have an affinity for the older Henry for a while. And then what I think is really neat about this story is that it reverses. That when she's having so much trouble with the older Henry and, you know, they're having problems, that she can go back to her young Henry and he helps her break free of this weight that her and the older Henry are going through. So. They both give something to her at different times. It's really good to see you. I think it's dangerous to be a slave to source material, but I think it's always important to absolutely try and capture the intention of the source material and, where possible, even improve on it because you have the ability to basically, you know, go in and tweak things that, uh, you know, that you almost have the benefit of hindsight. You get to read this book and go, wow, wouldn't it be interesting if you change this and change this? What's up with you? I'm pregnant. I mean, it's not like I cheated on you. But I do think you owe it to the author and the people who have read the book and taken it into their hearts that the essence of the source material needs to be uh, respected. Yeah, I mean, just looking at what they chose to pair that with you know in the show obviously it's all happening on the wedding day at least from henry's perspective and so we get that really great mirror between oh older or younger claire is getting to marry older henry but at the same time older claire is choosing younger henry blah 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 um but then in the movie it's paired with like it, i guess it's kind of her revenge for him going back and like ruining their first kiss which i thought was i thought that was so odd because for all the complaints that show got about grooming and all of that and of course moffat had to go and underline it with a big red marker and so of course it got more complaints but i remember watching this movie um i don't think it was the first time and i was like oh hot take you know this is grooming and yeah people were like, yeah not really but watching it now i'm like this is so much worse than what moffat did um just in terms of how the time travel is structured i mean he goes back and on the very first time is like oh in the future you're gonna be so pretty and you know and then the first kiss it's just really bad it's bad you'll love this the kiss so you know afterwards when he goes back to contemporary adult claire he's like i think you, you looked about 18 there um, which, which is the film being a bit sly there. Uh, in the book, and I think, honestly, in the movie, because he only says looks 18, in the book, she is 16 there. Uh, so his angry, forceful kissing of her uh, is when, she, you know, she's still a child, you know, which is something the, um, the, sh the show didn't even do, that beat. Yeah, so it's fascinating. The movie really avoids the grooming stuff by not focusing on young Claire much at all, and it's not very interested in the question. And that's why, you know, the show dwells on it to a fault perhaps but yeah you're right if you think the movie through it's it's quite direct with how it's doing that it's just not dwelling on it and making you think about it except for that 
scene which I found striking and bizarre in the book and I find striking and bizarre here even with the oh maybe she was 18 you know not 16 there mm-hmm. it's it's still not a pleasant scene yeah but and then but it ends with you know the big pull out crane shot it's like really romantic and oh you know they were kissing and you know look they're in the field isn't this magical it, but that's you know that's a alarming scene to me yeah absolutely and if the framing of that scene didn't make it clear enough you know, the big uh, epic crane pulling out shot, you know, and how it's all portrayed. If that didn't make it clear enough that the film was doing that romantically, I guess the film, you know, does say 18. So the film's trying to suggest uh, she's not a child in that scene, uh, even though it doesn't, you know, explicitly it says looks 18. Um, but still, no matter what her age, it's still kind of unpleasant because, you know, it's a slap and then it's a forceful kiss. It's, uh, yeah, I. But, I mean, here's what Eric Banner had to say about it, so uh, take that as you will. I was never concerned about it being creepy or weird or anything like that because I just really felt like if we were at a point in the story where we really understood Henry's love for Claire, that would be an incredible thing, this notion of being able to visit your wife when she's a little girl and hang out with her and see what she's like and try and have some kind of positive influence. You know, obviously when you play those scenes, you are trying to imagine the older Claire and at the same time, you just enjoy the moment that's occurring between the two of you and let that sort of guide it. To be clear, when he's saying little girl Claire there, he's not referring to the dubiously 16 or 18 year old Claire. He's talking about the different actress, the actual child, 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 uh, very young Claire that he visits and just saying what he thought the general tone of their interactions were in the film, which as we've said, you know, in the show, Moffat really concentrates more on you know Moffat very loudly dismisses it being grooming like he'll get quite um aggressive about that even uh, how much he doesn't think there's any relation to that but he does bring it up you know and he has characters say I groomed you um and he you know tosses grooming out there as a joke the show is very clearly aware of the connotations a story could have or does have to some people whereas the film just like Nate's saying it doesn't really go into that in general and you know the film makers don't and the actors don't seem to really um, consider it or think it's, you know, there or not there or getting raised or not raised. So, yeah, I guess that's how the film went about it. After watching the show and getting um, the comparisons to the film, I, I, I'd put up the impression that the film was generally better with the grooming stuff by virtue of exclusion, right, by not touching on it. But that, I, watching it, I was floored. That It's extremely gross. Yeah. It's real bad in the film and worse for not being acknowledged i think um i think it plays it worse than the show does as in it plays it more uncomfortably and then doesn't talk about that uncomfortableness where i think as with a lot of my fat's writing the, the 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 sort of the catch to mainstream success is that he likes doing the the really uncomfortable stuff and then prodding it with a stick and asking why it's uncomfortable and what it means. Um, I assumed that the, the, the film just didn't touch on it at all, but it does and then doesn't mention it, which is grim. Claire does have that line, uh, you forced yourself into the heart of a little girl or something like that in their argument in the present timeline after the first kiss. But yeah, it's ge- it's generally quite neglected, yeah. And I think that's part of Claire's perspective not being a big deal in the show at all. The whole idea that she built herself around... In the film, you mean, yeah. ...Henry is touched on. It's not really dwelt on in the same way that, you know, the the, the show's really concerned with um, them making each other. The role that each of their agencies have and the way that they are, as people, formed around each other. That's sort of the whole premise of the show. Um, it doesn't feel like it's a massive part of Claire's character. She seems much more in the moment uh, living this relationship as it happens um, without thinking particularly about the way she was created by Henry. And they connect so quickly, like 20 minutes into the film when they're on that park bench, they're, you know, they're making out with each other and he's doling out the exposition for how the time travel works. And it's just like they're already in sync and all clicked in and so you know that drama of how how do they get to know each other at you know these ages when she's known him at a different age for all this time uh, what does he think of this is the woman i'm predestined to be it's just kind of they fell in love right away and you know that's it that's we're off to the races let's do a play-by-play of interesting scenes from the book it's just it's 
it's easier to kind of just sink into isn't this a lovely warm bath of a romance but it it is less interesting isn't it yeah if you were adapting the the book to specifically a romance film would it not be more interesting to make it the story of them getting together set over i guess the same sort of time frame as the tv show um and then you bring in all the stuff from their future to reflect on that you know with time travel and with flash forwards and flashbacks and whatnot but you frame the story itself as them getting together because that's what romance movies tend to be and that that people love the like look at titanic people love the um kind of oh you know we they're looking back on you know the love stories that came in it ends this kind of wistful this it's like a movie in a movie then it makes it even more kind of fairy taleish yeah he, they even excise i don't, I don't want to get uh, too much into the book's ending because of nate but you can see they kind of make it a little more toothless don't they they more straightforward and i think less sad and less encompassing ending the way they choose to end like the henry claire relationship here the 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 last beat with gomez in the book uh what i found haunting <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But when I read it at the time, just stuck with me like nothing else, just jammed in my brain. There's that's I think um I think this film impacted the way people read the book. Yes. Uh yes. especially how they read the story without having read the book. I think there's um an impression surrounding the TV show that the the f- the, the book is basically a uh, a time travel romance with some uh, elements yeah, in it. It's the first half, mate. But the like the last third of the book is horrifying. It's it's yeah. It's, it's, it's honestly it's bizarre. Um, the novelist, you know, Stephen Moffat, um, in Doctor Who, if he's like doing a two part, often he'll he'll shift the genre of the second episode completely. That's what the novelist does uh, with the novel uh, for the time traveler's wife, but. Yeah, the the film plays the whole thing in the tone of the first half, you know, where it's much more, you know, a straightforwardly romance thing. And that's why I think why the pacing kind of worked between the first half of the film where I'm like, okay, we, you know, it's a bit of a roller coaster, but yeah, let's go. I kind of lost the characters in the, uh, the last third or the second half of the film. And I think it's because they're dealing with much trickier material, but they're keeping it kind of in the tone of the first half. Like the miscarriages stuff, it's kind of underplayed here. It feels a bit weird to me because it's such a serious, you know, thing that's happening and the film just kind of treats it as a little obstacle and they fix it, you know, quite quickly. I, I, I do I do actually really like the first scene with Alba and I like a lot of the Alba scenes, but it's 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 kind of just matter of the fact, well, I'm dying soon, <laughs> you know, so, so it goes. And, you know, it just kind of... It, the, I, I lose Henry a bit in the, in the back third of the film just because I think it's... Mm-hmm. it's the tone isn't really folding into how dark a lot of the material is, yeah. And it's interesting how uh, linear even the non-linear stuff in the film feels. It's definitely not written for people who have, as I put it, clinical Doctor Who brain. Um, in the, like, b- bits of... The main use of the time travelling is for little bits of foreshadowing. You know, we see Henry wounded for a second, which happens in the book, and we see... Um, uh, Alba, they pass Alba on the street and we get a, a big long shot of her looking at them and we go, oh, she's going to be important. I bet she's the daughter. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't, that's, that, that's the main use of time travel to do those little one scene foreshadowing stuff. And that's, you know, that's clever enough for a romance movie, but it doesn't take the same joy um, that the TV show has. And I think the book has with tying things around themselves and, uh, and leading scenes into each other and uh, expressing the whole thing time travelly. This this is a good point to bring up something I really wanted to talk about uh, with the film. So, so the novel came out in 2003 and the novel was written by American novelist Audrey Niffenegger and it was her first novel. Isn't that amazing? And she, Audrey is a really interesting woman, I think. I love reading her interviews and stuff. Interesting lady, very into visual art. That's kind of her background. And so Stephen Moffat, you know, Sherlock, Doctor Who, showrunner, all that, was a huge fan of her and her novel with its influence super plain in his work, like Oliver's been saying. Well, in The Girl in the Fireplace, David Tennant episode in 2006, very, very clearly and openly 
patterned after the time traveler's wife. And the novelist references the girl in the fireplace in her second novel. Big mutual respect between the novelist and Moffat. The novelist has effused over Stephen Moffat before. She's spoken happily about the TV show. Uh, she's been struck sadly when the TV show was recently cancelled. She's spoken positively about the changes the show has made. She was talking up the show as it was getting made and when Moffat got the rights and everything. Super positive about the show. And we're discussing the film. Uh, so why am I bringing this up? It's because the novelist hasn't even seen the movie. <laughs> uh, nor really? spoken particularly positively about it. No. So back in 2007, when the film was entering production... This interview asked her, you know, The Time Traveler's Wife is a very cinematic book. When you were writing it, did you think about how it would look on screen? And Audrey said, I was thinking very much about what it would look like if I made a movie out of it, but the movie that I would make is not the movie that's going to be made. And she said, the thing with having it made into a movie that's so strange is that I'm used to being the maker of it, and now these other people are making it, which strikes me as the weirdest thing in the whole world. And she said, when people come and look at it and view it, well, hopefully they'll at least get some of what the book was about. She says, the director looks like a smart guy and in a collaborative process, many things can run amok. And remember that whatever the movie is, they're not editing the book. They can't add or (laughs) subtract anything from the actual book. On the other hand, people who haven't read the book, who see the movie, may get an entirely different impression from anything she's ever intended. She said she did read the script and she thinks everybody who's supposed to die do die and she found that promising. But on the other hand, she said they've been tinkering with the ending but you've just got to trust in a way they're well-intentioned and we'll see what they manage to do. Sometimes you just have to shut your eyes. Every writer that I've ever talked to about this basically says, just remember the movie is not your movie and you really have nothing to do with it. That seems to be the collective wisdom of writers about this whole concept. And in another interview, she said, I've got my little movie that runs in my head and I'm kind of afraid that will be changed or wiped out by what someone else might do with it. And it is sort of thrilling and creepy because now the characters have an existence apart from me. So that's all well and good. The time period from the original novel being published and the movie in 2009, it was six years and there was a tremendous amount of... uh, different scripts, different people working on it, all kinds of craziness. And I was just kind of a bystander to it. I just kind of stood back and watched it and tried to learn something about how things work in Hollywood. Uh, so this time around, um, it started with a, me receiving an email from Stephen, who I already knew and who I'm a big fan of. And I got this email and uh, I said to my husband and my assistant, oh, no, <laughs> they're going to do this again. But uh, but then I calmed down and I thought, no, no, it's Stephen. It's going to be good. It's going to be all right. And uh, so I just kind of hung on to that thought all the way through. <laughs> Where it gets really interesting is, you know, people sometimes put on Goodreads or Twitter or Pinterest or those quote websites or wherever else. These quotes that well, sometimes they're from this movie. Sometimes they're not from any version of the Time Traveler's Wife at all. But these quotes that will get attributed to Audrey, so to the novel, and Audrey will sometimes see them on Twitter and be like, I didn't write that. <laughs> Maybe it's from the movie. <laughs> so she gets these lines attributed to her that she didn't write and she'll often correct people. I didn't see the movie. I'm told the movie's ending is different from the book. So proceed with caution. Uh, yeah, a lot of that, which is all well and good. And if not for the show, you could just think, well, some novelists are like that. They don't, you know, they, they're not into movies. And, you know, she said, I read the script and realized that the movie would not be mine. It belongs to the people who made it. I decided not to watch it because it would overwrite the movie in my head. And that's all well and good. But if it's just on the basis of it being a film, why is she so happy with the TV show? And why does she specifically single out liking changes that are in the TV show from the actors and the writer? So I think that's super interesting. All the people who are supposed to die, die is a great line. (laughs) That's that's a great way of assessing something that's adapted from your book. You go, yeah, I guess all the right people die. If that's what's important, that happens. That's great. Talk about damning with faint praise. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The characters' names are the same. (laughs) I'm looking at a tweet from 2015. Someone says to her, Still can't over, I guess still can't get over, that the film version of The Time Traveler's Wife didn't follow the book ending. Audrey Niffenegger shouldn't have allowed it. Weary emoji. 
and Audrey replies, um, they didn't actually consult me about that or much of anything, really. It's the filmmaker's movie, not mine. Hmm. So I think, uh, well, I think Stephen Moffat clearly being, you know, head over heels with her and her writing um, must have enraptured her, but also that she already liked his work. You know, she was a fan of his writing already. And so I guess there was a kind of reciprocal thing going on there and that she, it's because obviously Stephen Moffat changed lots of stuff, but I think she liked his writing and she liked what he was doing with the show. So I don't think she actually has an anti adaptation stance. I think she has, uh, I didn't love the script for this film <laughs> stance since she seemed to get over the, I, I can't, you know, look at a visual adaptation or overwrite the thing in my head. She seemed to get over that just fine with an adaptation she did like. So, you know, I mean, I like the film. I'm not trying to um, dress down the film here, but I just think it's super interesting when there's two different live action adaptations of your work and you're really positive about one and you're kind of very diplomatic about the other. I'm not sure that those comments are as much of a, um, a disparagement, I guess, as they read as. Um, I've not seen all the films I've written because uh, a lot of them, I know that the the people who took the script went and did something different with it. And I go, OK, I, I'm not sure I can watch it, but I, th- I'm fine with that. And I think a lot of writers are sort of just OK with that and they don't need to watch it. And that's not necessarily obviously it's it's, you know. You would rather the writer was really on board with your version, but I don't think it's, um, I don't think there's necessarily a real animosity there. Yeah, I guess it just looks selective if, you know, you're like, oh, well, I don't watch adaptations of my scripts <laughs> as a rule. And then one comes out and you're like, you got to watch this one. You know, this is amazing. Yeah. Well, the, 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 there's very, her and Moffat are very clearly on the same wavelength. They're yeah. both, the thing people overlook about the book is how thorny and uncomfortable and complicated it is on purpose yeah and how much it's about that um and you can see i mean that's been the main criticism of the the tv show but that's also the 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 way in which it's truest to the book is it it interrogates the issues and it's interested in them i think on the note of comparisons so audrey has said it's difficult to boil down a novel into a two-hour movie. It will be lovely to have hours and hours to stretch out into. This was in 2018. Uh, and Moffat himself has said, I liked the movie and a lot of people love that movie. It takes us probably three episodes to nail down how the time travel really, really works and make sure the audience is confident with it, by which time in the movie you've barely got any time left to lavish on what it's really about, which is about being the time traveler's wife and what the relationship is like, and above all, what is love like, what is good love like, which is the theme of the book, which it explores brilliantly. And he said elsewhere, I mean, I think it's a good movie. It has to spend quite a lot of its running time getting the rules right, and they do it very efficiently and very effectively, actually in the movie explaining it, but it places a greater emphasis on the time travel, and therefore Henry, than is the case in the book, where if anything, the emphasis is on Claire and in their life, because you've got the space just to say, well, here are the rules of time travel. Have you got them yet? I'll remind you. Well, I'll remind you. You there, you've got. It's funny, Moffat saying there, the film places more emphasis on the time travel, which I don't feel, but I absolutely agree. It places more emphasis on the time traveler to the expense of Claire. Yeah. The film spends a lot of dialogue on the time travel, which I think I is a key difference. The, the, the film has a lot of explaining how the time travel works, a lot of Henry seeing Claire down and going, these are the rules. Um, or the, I, the one that really struck me was Henry saying to his younger self, you can't change things, it's always going to happen anyway. And that's the explanation we get. We're obviously in the TV show, you've got like half an episode spent on that relationship between uh, Henry teaching his younger self and yeah. you've got that great set piece where he sits him down in the um in in the canteen area uh and uh, and says you're gonna get up and run towards that side of the room and that'll prove me right and and you you can spend scenes and scenes showing and making the audience feel that that's how it works and establishing the rules in an emotional way and i think you probably have to slightly reprogram your brain for the tv show because you need to buy into this idea that 
determinism and free will can coexist, right? The, the future is set in stone, but you will choose that future of your own free will. That's a complicated idea that the TV show is trying to communicate, and the film obviously doesn't have room for that, um, and also doesn't really have the curiosity in it, I don't think. Well, the film touches on that a little bit when she rejects the proposal. Yeah, um, that's true. And and I thought like happened. that little line there, like, oh, yeah, I just wanted to to exercise my free will for a second, but I'm kidding. And it's like, OK, so what, <laughs> what's that? For you? Like, yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> it's a very cute uh, scene, but yeah, it, it's it's telling for sure. Something I find really weird in the movie is like, so he dies, you know, partially by getting shot by his father-in-law, which is like rife with. <laughs> you can read so much into that but the film like doesn't like we barely meet the guy uh let alone the brother and like the the shooting and all that happens but it's like it's so underplayed that this is the bit where i feel like these adaptations that just scoop out scenes from books kind of willy-nilly and it's like it, you, it's hard to kind of find a thematic track like the show has a very specific very loud, very, very loud, you know, set of themes it's trying to get through and that it's trying to interpret the book through. But the film, there's some things here where I'm like, this is such a weird or interesting thing they're taking from the book, but I feel it feels kind of empty to me because I just feel like it's not just not having the time, it's not really having the focus or the interest in, you know, trying to say what could be said with the craziness of this story. Like, get, getting shot like that is really interesting. And, like, the film, like, we see the um the animal... Uh, you know, where he wakes up in the snow there and it like looks good and everything. But I'm like, this is such a weird and interesting thing to happen, you know, for this to be, you know, what bloodies you. But it, we don't we don't know enough of the father to, you know, to really think about what does this mean or what does it represent to get shot by that. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't really have the death scene. I don't have anything to compare it with because I haven't read the book yet. Um, and I actually didn't know that the show wasn't renewed. So um, that's yeah. that's very disappointing. Um, is, I'm kind of yeah. going through like the five stages of grief over here. <laughs> yeah. um, but I guess I'll read the book. Um, in the film, I didn't even realize that it was the father-in-law until rewatch. Because, yeah. Well, there you, go. Yeah. you know, on the second watch, when you know what's going to happen... And then every scene or line with the father is basically him being like, okay, never mind all of that, hunting. And then later the wife is like, oh, you know, he's just always hunting. And it's like, okay, so he's the hunter. Oh, I see what's going on. But um, but then I also liked, I caught for the first time that you actually hear Alba calling for, calling like dad, dad, right as he gets shot. And I liked I liked that little um, that little touch, but obviously I have to read the book um, because I'm sure that as touching as the movie was with the whole death scene, or at least I found it touching. And certainly at the very end, uh, when there's the whole like getting a few seconds with him after he's gone, I mean that's just straight up wish fulfillment. I wouldn't be yeah. surprised if they crafted the entire film just leading up to that moment. Um, because everyone wants that. What the the wish fulfillment thing for me in the film is that first scene with Alba in the in the zoo where she sees him and they have this talk. I just that that is really doing a lot of what I love about the Alba scenes in the book there. And in a funny way, that um the, the Alba there is like the Claire from the book and the show that I like. That I don't really feel in Rachel McAdams Claire, but I feel that kind of assertiveness and. Uh, you know, sense of this is my will and, you know, my opinion and personality and I'm pushing it out there, you know, like it or not. I feel that from the movie's Alba where I don't feel it from the movie's Claire. But she, yeah, I, I really like that first scene. And, she, you know, she's just explaining, oh, this is how this works. This is how this works. I love seeing you here. Yep, you die uh, when I'm five. Like she's so in the zone and uh, such a, uh, I think, a, makes a strong impression there in that first scene. I don't like some of her mm-hmm. latest scenes so much. But in that first scene, I think she really feels... Kind of like the authority in the scene there. Uh, and I, I think that's just great. Especially the show having been, you know, recently cancelled. And as much as the show did suggest and embed bits from the back half of the book into the first half of the book, uh, it was a real joy, you know, to watch this again today after the show having finished and to being able to see this back half of the story. Even, you know, not always in the way 
I would have preferred, but to like see Alba and to see these beats played, it was nice. There was some finality to watching it in live action, uh, even with different actors. But that first Alba scene is one of my favourite scenes in the film. I really like that. You've got all the nice stuff with um, two different Albas hanging out together. Yeah. Being a room for it. I feel like the film deals with Alba pretty well, actually. Um, yeah. I, I quite liked that. Um uh, and it's a shame that the TV show isn't going to get a chance to do that. The sequel, the spin-off novel that Audrey Niffenegger has been working on forever, uh, forever and ever. She's been working on and off on this uh, and she's uh, reportedly finished it as of this year. So hopefully we might be looking at a 2023 20, release of it. Uh, so uh, uh, it's it's very present for me. Uh, the book it's very it's very important to me, and it's uh, always a pleasure to read it, Audrey. And I'm looking forward to the next one if you ever finish it. No mm-hmm. pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. <laughs> I know, but you said you had to write another chapter or something. I did. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 really miserable of them. How dare they make you do more work? <laughs> I'm I'm sure there'll be more bits and pieces, but that's I think it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Oh, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, that may or may not get adapted. I don't know in what form. I mean, she loves Stephen Moffat. I think it would be a total pipe dream to, you know, say, well, HBO, who have the rights to the Time Traveler's Wife book, you know, have cancelled it. But, you know, no one has the rights to the sequel book yet. Could someone else get the sequel book and could Moffat get on board <laughs> for adapting? HBO do one series of that. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like adapting season one and then adapting season four or whatever of, you know, this big story <laughs> with, with two seasons in the middle missing. That That's my oh. um, total pipe dream fantasy. But even Moffat or no, uh, you know, th- that sequel book could get adapted. So, And th- the sequel focuses on Alba uh, as an adult. So we could be seeing more of Alba in some form in future. Who knows? Okay. Given that... I, I, I've done a bit of... Re- it's called The Second Husband, is it? The Other Husband. The Other Husband. Oh, thank goodness she didn't call it The Time Traveler's Daughter. <laughs> oh, that was just laying right there to be picked up. Okay, sorry, go on. I, um... I, I've... I, last time you mentioned the sequel book, I went and did a bunch of research. It, it would be unbelievably neat. It would be the kind of magic trick wish fulfillment that the show and the book love doing. Uh, if by adapting the sequel book, Moffat got a chance to fill in the second half of the TV show that he didn't get to do. The, the sequel, Audrey said, will contain scenes like set within. The, there'll be like, um, she said there will be some Henry in the sequel book. So I don't get the impression it'll be a big consistent thing in the book. But, you know, so by virtue of that, I, I mean, the right situation must like, you know, Warners or whoever owns the Time Traveler's Wife live action rights, I'm sure would frown if you push it too far and you try and just do season two straight <laughs> up. But I'm sure there could be, I mean, if in the sequel book, if it's got scenes with a younger Henry and, you know, with an adult Alba, there's rig- wriggle room, perhaps, who knows. You just coincidentally recast Theo James. <laughs> just, we've cast the same people again. <laughs> yeah, so much of the latter half of the story was collapsed into the first season of the TV show. I mean, I was, I was kind of blown away with how much time the film spends. Well, okay. Again, I don't know the book version of the story, but I was blown away by how much time the film spends on the whole vasectomy argument and everything around that when that's already handled. It's like season two of the TV show could have picked up with Claire pregnant and it wouldn't have missed that much from the film story, okay? I, I'm sure that there's more, but uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that this is denial, guys. This is bargaining, it's, maybe? No, I, I, the show, I think it's, I mean, straightforwardly, it's the first half of the book, but there's a lot of bits of the second half and ideas from it. It embeds through it. And it's little... Like having the feet and the blood in the first episode is, mm-hmm. you know, a big part of what, you know, the end game of the movie and the book is about. Uh, Alba is in the show. She's in it, you know, twice. We see her in the finale and in episode two, you know, the 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 zoo scene that we see in the film, we get, you know, a lovely little tease of that uh, in the show in episode two as well, which is something people just watching the show, having not seen the film or read the book, aren't going to, you know, recognize, you know, that little Easter egg there. But it's there. It's there. 
Uh, I didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exa- I didn't notice on my first watch of the episode either. Going to go um, back and watch it but again. But it's there. It's there. And then the finale, of course, does the big surreal. And the film, uh, you know, does a version of that too. Uh, great sequence where Henry's kind of being thrust through time in a kind of trippy way. And, you know, he leaves his hand print on the glass, you know, f- you know, towards the death scene. Uh, so, the, yeah, the show, it didn't get to do all the meat and potatoes of the second half like the film got to. But it absolutely did, sh- you know, suggest a lot of it and, you know, put some of the iconic parts of it in there. So, I've, you know, it, the show cancelled is such a shame that we don't get to see Moffat interpret the second half. But I don't feel like the show didn't include the second half at all. It just included it in impressions. And, you know, the film is so short, you know, by comparison that you can even argue the film is kind of similar. Like, it it gets to do the whole plot of the second half, but it's doing it at such an accelerated rate that it's like where the, where the show can go, uh, you know, deep, the film can go wide but shallower. You know, if you, if you want to think of it, the, show, the show's like a big deep well and the film's like a big wide puddle, I guess you could say. Uh, so, you know, there's drawbacks to both ways, but I, I don't feel like the show... Um, was just like the first half of the movie stretched across six episodes. No, no, I don't, you know, feel that way. I wonder how much the focus on the vasectomy argument is because that's quite a uh, conventional. Um, it's it's an argument that a non time traveling couple can have yeah. with a neat time travel solution to it. I mean, the it's um, I think the book sort of plays this as well. Um, and the TV show, the little bit we see of it, but, um, the, 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 the miscarriages are just miscarriages, right? There's a bit of a time travel explanation, but they're not like fun or anything. They're just actual miscarriages. And it's played as basically an illness as we were And the book, the, whereas the book is literally body horror, like a really grotesque body horror. Um, the book, the fi- what well, I do admire that the film picks a tone and then it sticks to that lane. It says we're doing this and we're not diverting from the course. We're going to give the people, you know, a lovely romance you can sink into. And we're going to, you know, there's going to there's bits of the book that are impossible to do that way, but we're going to make it work, even if it's just doing a kind of flash of that bit of the book and not dwelling on it and doing it very quickly. We're going to shove the story into our lane, which I think uh, wouldn't have been easy for the script writers because the book is really, really thorny, uh, like you were saying, Oliver. So I think it doesn't always work for me, but I think the film has a firm hand on its tone, which a lot of films don't accomplish. Uh, and, you know, you can, that that's a point in its favour and, and otherwise, but the film does succeed in maintaining that tone, but it does mean you lose some of the uniqueness of the book. Uh, absolutely. But to, to be honest, there's stuff in the book I don't want in live action just mm-hmm. because I don't want to see some some of the really horrifying bits of, you know, the book. I dread to think how that would have could have been realised. I, I think it's always done quite um, deftly. But the show does, like all my fat stuff, whip around tone. Yeah. Just all the time. You, you swing from a massive farce to a really depressing confrontation with suicide in it within minutes of each other right the yeah the, the the show has this whiplash tonality where the the film absolutely goes here's our tone you know there's going to be some serious stuff but basically this is a comfortable watch that's that's what i like comparis what's what i like comparing about the two of them is i think they're both successful adaptations but they both take such a different approach to the book they take such a different approach to the characters they take such a different approach to the tone and the nature of adapting and i think it's so interesting you know to watch them especially back to back where it's like i can see this is the same story um but it's incredible how different you can make the same story feel depending on how you want to play it tonally what interests you the most it's so revealing isn't it like moffat's psyche is laid bare in the show it's so obvious even if he didn't constantly blab it out in interviews it's so obvious what he thinks about a lot and what interests him about marriages and this kind of thing. And the movie, it's, you know, it's the same way. You can see what the script writers and directors are engaged with there. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of that joy of discussing a book at all, I guess, is that it's the same Audrey book, you know, everyone has read here, but you can come at it in such different ways. It's like the grooming is a great example of it because like the film didn't really spur the debates the way the show did or the book did you know um, when the book came out and in the years the book got popular uh 
which is like kind of the core of the relationship, the core of the story, really. So it's amazing just how having a different kind of salient points of characters and a story can totally change the impressions that the same story and the same characters can give people. I think it's a really interesting... Any Anyone who's seen the show, I think, should um, probably watch the movie just because it's so, so short. It's not two hours. It's not a long movie. The show is cancelled. You'll, you'll get to see the back half of the story this way. I think it's really worth it to just engage with this is a different take. Isn't this interesting um, how different they feel? And here's the other half of the story as well. I did. I I, I watched the film after the news it was the show was cancelled mm. and so it was it was some small relief to me watching the second half and going oh i can imagine how it would have been done in the show it's it's the alba stuff for me it's like i don't love i don't love a lot of how the movie adapts the second half that's less successful for me than the first half but still just getting to see alba um you know kind of makes it worth it to me it's like like you said about the wedding it's striking how much um, more straightforward the the film plays those bits um, where with the it, it, it's I sort of had in my head before watching this that it was a rom-com but it's very much not it's a no. romance film um, and I think there's something I think it might have worked better as a rom-com um, because the joke telling logic of the show really works for it the stuff like um like when in the last episode on the wedding day uh henry shows up uh out of nowhere finally just in time for the wedding but it's the wrong one um the way that plays in the show is built up to and it jumps at you with a punchline and you realize ah this is how this is gonna click together i get it there's a joke telling logic to it that the film doesn't really have. It sort of feels more procedural. I the guess. film is so uninterested in conflict. How can you have jokes without tension? You know, it's so I think that just the kind of nature of the film doesn't really lend itself to jokes because the film is less interested in tension and in conflict. So like, th- there's no stakes for the joke that oh, it's the wrong Henry so much because it's like so what? You know, um, she just laughs. Yeah. And, you know, it all goes fine. So what can be funny about it if nothing's actually going wrong? There's not really a surprise. And you, you need like a turn or a shift for a joke. But the film is kind of so mellow that it's like, well, what's what's there to laugh about? It'll all be fine. That's the thing. Things don't really go wrong in the film. <laughs> yeah. Nothing goes wrong. I think that's to its credit and its detriment. It makes it a really relaxing watch, you know, which is part of why it's worked so well for so many people. And in certain moods... I would enjoy the film more than the show, but I'm going to remember the show more because it was thornier and it did more stuff and it was more interesting to me. I I don't think... Obviously, the runtime and the audience... The audience is probably the big thing. The intended audience of the show, of the film, meant it had to be a very certain thing, right? Yeah. Um, I don't, and I don't think... I think it's very easy to watch the film and go... Uh, look, it's less clever with the time travel. It's not really getting the book. Um, but I think it's a very deliberate decision, right? It's of course, yeah. it's not that they can't do clever time travel stuff. It's that this is the film is for an audience who want a romance film, and the TV show is for an audience who have jumped directly from Doctor Who and like that circular running into itself time travel stuff i don't know i think it's hard to pin down the show's audience (laughs) maybe this is part of why it wasn't renewed although i mean moffat was one among many sharing analytics of it apparently doing very well on hbo max but being on hbo max at all especially during a merger and for my money the merger is probably the big sort of unspoken cause of the cancellation and people are talking about viewership or the critical reception even, but I think it's probably the classic falling through the cracks in a merger. You know, old execs greenlight something, then those old execs aren't part of the new form of company and new execs won't continue on with a lot of their ideas and a lot of their shows. I think you, you were seeing, we've seen other shows like uh, Dances, uh, Raised by Wolves, <laughs> Raised by Wolves rather, um, I think fell through the cracks as well. Uh, just one of those shows, Victim of a Merger. 
that's my opinion anyway. Who knows? Who knows if we'll ever know? Anyway, I have no idea how many Doctor Who fans jumped on Time Traveler's Wife, the show, because of time travel and or because of Moffat show running it. I think the show's exact audience is going to remain a bit opaque. Whereas, like we literally heard the filmmakers say earlier, the film was always made specifically for a mass audience. You know, those very words, mass audience. It doesn't feel like it's written in four dimensions in the way the, the TV show feels like it's written sort of holistically and scenes tie into how other scenes begin and things loop around and connect to each other. And uh, there's this joke telling thing going on throughout the whole thing where the film feels a lot more scene by scene. I agree. I think this is part of why Audrey was probably lit up by Moffat adapting because Moffat is someone who's interested in all this kind of stuff she's interested in, you know, which, you know, excites her that, oh, he's interested in, you know, complex romance kind of stuff. He's interested in complex time travel stuff and, you know, structural playfulness and stuff. You know, therefore, this is going to adapt the book in ways that, as Audrey, I will be interested in because that's stuff I'm into. For the film, it's like, well, it's her story, you know, so by nature of that, that's interesting to her. But, like, is the film concerned with the stuff the novel, and by extension, the novelist is concerned with? I don't... Not so much, I think. You know, the film is very concerned with telling a romance story really well. I don't think the book is as interested in that as people remember or as people say. You know, maybe the first half, but that's only 50% of a book. You know, the back half isn't interested in telling a relaxing love story, not in the slightest. Uh, So I I think just because it's the same story doesn't mean it's going to be the kind of, be of the same mindset of the author or or even the book itself. Because, you know... even as it takes some lines from the book, it's characters and, you know, a premise and a plot are just a skeleton. You know, that's why we can see such different flesh in the show uh, to the film. Yeah. Putting aside time travel, are there any other films that have this kind of structure? I'm struggling off the top of my head to think of any romance films that cover, what, like 10 years of a relationship? A bit more? Um at this kind of pace where it's um, sort of sort of one speed throughout just going through their relationship instead of having a heavy focus on the marriage or a heavy focus on before the marriage. I can't think of anything else. Yeah, there's like family epics that go pretty quick, but that's, you know, the romance isn't the main thing of that. That'll be like a dynasty story, you know, that they might want to get through quickly. There's... Yeah, because most romance stories, you know, will have a smaller, you know, it might be the story of getting together and, you know, having the first kid or getting together and breaking up or anything like that. But just to kind of go through such a length of time, uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. I think time travel and romance go together hand in glove. You know, so many great films um, are basically mixing those things. We've got uh, Groundhog Day, uh, About Time. Eve of the Daleks, you know, they're, it's, it's a match made in heaven, <laughs> for sure. I'm trying to remember how much of a time span about time covers, because that's a really good movie. Yeah, um, it's, I, I, yeah, I think it's a better time travel romance film, for sure. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it's more concerned with the time travel, and, and I'm, I'm trying to remember if that, but, you know. In, in some aspects, that's also a family movie rather than yeah. a, like, just romance. It's but about time is one of those stories where it's very much got its themes, you know, on its sleeve. It's got, I have, you know, I'm trying to say a certain thing through the time travel here. And I think that, you know, works in its favor. This film, the Time Traveler's Wife film, I don't really, like, it does the story successfully, but I feel like it's kind of a play-by-play of aspects of the novel with a certain tone decided on. I agree that we have the illness coding very much, but I don't really feel like this is much of a, this is the big statement we're trying to say here, which I do kind of get with about time, which as Bill Nye, you know, pretty plainly stated, you know, a couple of times what it's trying to say. Uh, but I it's not, I think time travel, I guess it lets you replay and reflect on domestic moments a lot. Um, maybe that's why it goes uh, with romance so well. I think, I think Nate's totally right that the structure this fits best is a, um is specifically the genre of uh of sort of medical romances stuff like um what's it called me before you 
yeah. not so much the John Green one, but those kinds of films, because they have that scope as well. They're not so much focused on the beginning of a relationship in the way that lots of romances are. Um, but it, but it's definitely an odd shape. I was thinking all the way through, this isn't a typical film structure at all. Um, it feels very adaptation-y. Uh, it, it's, there's no clear sense of, you know, an act structure. The wedding is in, even really the midpoint, um, which you would assume. And it- now it's the the miscarriage, yeah. The the miscarriage and uh, talking with Doctor Kendrick is the mis is the middle point, yeah. Yeah, which is an odd place to put the emphasis. Uh, that's that's like the first conflict <laughs> really comes halfway into the film, right at the middle of the film, which is odd. It's um, shape wise, it is just a bit weird. It's not the way films tend to be structured. Oh, uh, something about the wedding. Uh, how did you guys like or not like or neutral on the the Love Will Tear Us Apart cover with that band and then going kind of into the montage uh, thing and then them jumping on the bed? What do you think of that whole sequence? My wife adores that cover of the song. She tried to get it at our wedding and I was like, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> like, this is literally a breakup <laughs> song. <laughs> then uh, watching it again last night, after having seen the TV show, she had a brilliant refutation about how actually love will tear us apart again is playing into those same Moffat themes about how, you know, every love story ends in, you know, death or tragedy in some yeah. way. Um, and I didn't have a good counter argument to that. So thanks, Moffat. <laughs> I like the cover too. I think it's very romantic. It's less uh, on the nose than get me to the church on time. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's true. Time. It's got time in it. <laughs> There's something kind of um, absurd to me. The jumping on the bed, bed and then he disappears. It's like, it's a, it's a, the film's pretty dramatic, but that's so melodramatic. And then, you know, the ring you yeah. know, hands onto the blanket alone and she stares at the ring. I've been abandoned. You know, it's, it's, it's a little overwrought uh, for me, uh, but I like the music. Yeah. The getting into the bedroom, looking at each other, giving each other gooey eyes and then hard cutting to bouncing on the bed feels like a very romance <laughs> romance beat that, like that's yeah. a rom-com and i feel yeah. like if the if the film had lent more into that rom-com energy with a bit of time travel thrown in that might have worked better for me um because that that's i mean it's a bit hack but it's also very funny oh you know this is this uh is re- this is very common in rom-coms but something i laugh at is uh so they're in a they've got their nice flat you know the first place they're living together and he comes back after his two weeks away uh, and she's like, this place is too small. You know, that's why I'm angry all the time. And you like, you can see behind her an apartment, you know, in a big city that I, I want to call that small you know, apartments. I've no. um, and then they win the lotto. It's like, this is, yeah, they're, they're so lucky. I was disconnecting from the characters a bit at that moment. There's so much winning the lottery feels like the clever time travel moment in the film and it that so much time is spent on it he calls out every number one by one like going look can you believe he's using time travel to win the lottery can you imagine where where in the show it's just he mentions it offhand to an empty room because he remembers being in that room I, and if you're gonna if you're gonna dwell on that beat i think what the book does so successfully there is you know her going he's not just doing he could have done this at any point in time and he's doing it only because I complained about this, that my art studio being mm. small. Like this is, he never would have thought of this or cared about doing this because he just wants to live a normal life. But he's, you know, he's gone and done this lotto idea just for me and specifically because of a complaint I made. I think that's the, that's why the moment is interesting to me in the book. Um, but I mean, like that literally, that sequence of events does happen in the film. She complains, my big apartment's too small, you know, and he wins the lotto for her. But it just feels less like a, it, it just feels more kind of a matter of fact thing in how it's played just by how he's like cheekily maybe a 32 you know you get the impression he's not really thought about winning the lottery before that it's not occurred <laughs> to him that he could do this i think i like the emotional beat you're describing neo where he's going out and doing this intentionally for her but 
they totally undermine that in the film by conflating her complaint about the studio being too small with her complaint about not her complaint necessarily, but her moodiness about him being gone for weeks. Right. And so I didn't even make the connection between those two things. I mean, I knew that they were going to move to a place that had room for a studio, but I thought that it was more him apologizing for being gone for two weeks, which again, I feel like they're really, you know, I'll say it again, medical drama, right? They're, they're trying to underline every opportunity they get that, oh yeah, it sucks for her, right? She's, she's alone on her wedding night. Oh, she's, you know, she's alone for two weeks and then all the other things that follow. And I mean, they set that up from the very first scene at the diner when she mentions the, um, the doctor, right? The, I forget his name. Um, Kendrick, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. She she names Doctor Kendrick, which they skip in the, um, in the show. I don't know yeah. what it's like in the book, but it's like they 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 set up from the very start. Okay, this is going to have doctors in it. Like they're trying to kind of manage your expectations. That whole conversation with Gomez, where he's like, "Look, don't marry this guy. He's got something wrong with him. I know he's nice, but like you're you're not gonna. This isn't going to be great for you." And that's, I can imagine that, that, thank goodness I haven't had this experience, but um, I can imagine that kind of conversation happening if you were marrying someone who's like terminally ill. Yeah. And you, you're right how the film does do a lot of the illness coding, but the film, I think, kind of neglects it with Alba, where it's just kind of, mm. it's brought up, but it's kind of dismissed as this will be an issue. In the book, it, that's a huge thing. And it's a, one of their big conflicts in the marriage uh, and with Dr. Kendrick is like over you know what are we doing here as is if we are, if if we have a pregnancy you know that comes to birth um successfully is you know what's what's their life going to be like you know and and you know and sh- if it's a girl you know for her to to spring up naked um it's it's only really brought up once in in the book but like you know is this going to open her up to you know sexual assault you know more yeah. commonly than henry would face it you know this is a really tough thing to be bringing a time travel into the world can we cure it you know all this kind of stuff the book it's funny because, you know, Stephen Moffat, sci-fi writer extraordinaire, you'd think would be more interested in the sci-fi, but he's so much less interested. He doesn't even, like, mention Dr. Kendrick in the show. And I'm curious, if it had gotten a season two, would it go into all the sci-fi stuff the book does with the genetic splicing and everything? I have no idea because he didn't seem interested in season one. And the film brings up some of the genetic stuff, but it's it's almost just to kind of dismiss this, this will be an issue. Uh yeah, which is a shame because I, I like that's one of the interesting parental conflicts to me in the book is uh, Henry's much more we got to tinker and we've got to, you know, do experiments on me and on Albert, you know, to try and see if we can cure it for her. And Claire's much more like you're not, you know, exper- you start experimenting on Albert, you're never going to stop. You know, it's no life for her to be, you know, um, these crazy experiments that don't seem to be working on you and make you stressed out on her. But I guess that's drama, you know, and the film doesn't want... So, the film doesn't want arguments, and I think it certainly wouldn't want an argument there, which you can't really resolve easily as a viewer. It's not like one of the sides is clearly right and one of the sides is clearly wrong. It's they both have fairly defensible points of view there, which means tension because you're watching and you're like, I can't resolve this. You know, there's no clean way to... You know, this one just has to say, sorry, this is an actual ethical dilemma, not easily solved. So I think it makes a lot of sense to me why the film just kind of glides over um, those aspects with Alba. It feels like the show leans away from, or maybe not leans away from, but um, doesn't play the medical slash illness angle quite as strongly as the film does because the show is very clear about keeping the focus on characters' decisions and yeah. flaws and the drama always comes from the fact that the things that these two characters want are in conflict um which uh for a uh, an illness story the drama is much more these two characters are against something they are getting through a physical thing together standing by each other's side it's a much more exterior conflict um that that characters, you know, battle through together rather than battling with each other, which is much more where the emphasis is in the TV show. That's a good point. Even when he's coming to terms with his death 
it's very much a sort of man versus himself like acceptance of the future um and yeah not that they actually this, show too much of yeah. that but that's what i can kind of infer is happening i get a that reminds me i get a weird sense like the film literally opens with a scene which is Henry like sucking at singing and his mum being like, well, you can do jingle bells. Okay. And he's like, no, I suck at singing. And then at the end where, you know, with Alba, like he basically he almost so dies odd. because he, he, he can't sing well enough to like stop where he's going. She's like, no, you just got to sing, um, you know, and then you sing well and you'll be able to control where you're going and it doesn't work for him. And he, you know, he ends up, you know, where he doesn't want to be. It's, it's like, I don't know what the message is. It's like a bizarre if you can't sing right, you're screwed, you know, in life. <laughs> that that moment in the field where they're running towards each other, like like stolen earth. Um <laughs> I, I no I I thought he was gonna disappear like stolen earth. Yeah. Um I thought he was gonna miss because she says um Alba says, you just have to sing and you can hold on. And he goes, nah, I can't sing. <laughs> and then runs off towards her. And I was like, oh, so because he can't sing. Because he's not listening to his daughter, he's going to disappear. But no, it was okay. They got a moment. Yeah. But odd. That That's a beat. I'm not sure what it's trying to say. Yeah. I'm not sure what that beat is doing. Before talking about the film's ending scene a bit more, um, just bringing up the kind of uh, book ending of the singing at the start and the end, it's, it's worth uh, listening a bit because there was a lot of mirroring and rhyming of scenes and stuff in the film. Uh, on the behind the scenes, the filmmakers sound uh, quite proud of what they were doing here. Uh, here's the director talking about that. There are really two reasons why he travels to the meadow. One is, of course, he meets Claire, but it's also the place where he dies. And in fact, the shot where he finds his clothes the first time he travels to the meadow is the same shot where we see that he's been killed. And a lot of the movie is actually constructed around echoes. We created our own pattern of repetition, I suppose, and the structuring principle was actually seasons. So the movie progresses from winter, spring, summer, fall, and then back to winter. You will see it in every shot. There are sort of hints everywhere what season you're in. And that was the thing that gave us the biggest headache. I've got two more quotes kind of on that theme. Uh, here's the production designer talking about a kind of uh, interesting structural thing they did kind of on that note. We have kind of an alternative time clock, which is a rotation of the season. So that, you know, you may have three scenes in a row that are in winter, but then the next scene will be in spring. And then you might have three scenes that are in spring, but the next one is in summer, even if you jump forward or backward years in time. Isn't that cool? I didn't notice that internal chronology with the seasons and how that works in the film. There's a lot of... the. I do think the characterization and a lot of the script is shallow for a lot of the film, but there's a lot of artistry that isn't, you know, just the the writing uh, and a lot of the directorial choices as well. Like the production designer there, I think that's pretty cool. A lot of the prop work, like uh, Claire's diary, doesn't look quite as River Song as the show envisioned it, but uh, I, I really liked how nature-y um, it was in the film as well, like the flowers pressed into it and everything. Clearly a lot of work went into there, like when Henry was rif rifling through it. But anyway, here's the director talking about bookends again and this this quote is more about the singing stuff we were just uh, joking around about there's certain things that are threaded through the movie you start with christmas you end with christmas and it's almost like henry purges the idea of christmas from all its tragedy and now that he has his own family at the end of the film he can actually enjoy christmas in a way that he was completely unable to on his own wow so the same way that we use Christmas as a barometer of his development, we use the song. Being from Germany and having spent my first 20 years of my life in Germany, that song, Es ist ein Rosensprung, represents Christmas. It means one thing in the beginning, it is definitely for him connected to his mother, but then it is something that they keep in the family because it is part of their family. There are currents that run through them and things that are being communicated through the generations. And we just kind of use the song to illustrate that. So that's interesting, but there's a couple of things where like, there's some technically interesting stuff, like the big, uh, what looks like a big wanna in the house and that big montage of Alba growing up where we hear that German song on the violin, a nice little bit of uh, Henry's dad teaching Alba the song. Like I can see the kind of writerly ideas there with, oh, you know, this makes sense how we're embedding that in the structure, but it, it still leaves me a bit cold because I'm not really feeling it in the characters and it still feels a little play by play 
of bits from the book, especially the accelerated pace there. So the end, skipping, not that one uh, Christmas Alba growing up thing, but the actual end in the meadow, the very, very end of the film, it, it, the end in general, I find the end kind of flat because, and I, this is, you know, they didn't not know what they were doing. They very intentionally looked at the book's ending and would have been like, oh, you know, we, that's not <laughs> what we want to do here. Um, so it's, you know, it's a kind of, it's kind of nice, gentle ending, but that's, you know, it kind of just kind of flows out of my mind afterwards. I remember some parts of the movie pretty well, but, you know, the ending, I I didn't remember that well before I rewatched it because I'm like, what, what does happen? It's because it just kind of fizzles um, to me because it's so kind of relatively undramatic and just kind of gentle. Um, not that the book's ending is like violent, but it's, um, it's sadder. Uh, at least to me, or it's, um, or it's 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 kind of more overwhelming. Um, the show, of course, ends on a big jubilant moment, kind of halfway through the book or halfway through the film, which is its own kind of you know approach. So they actually all have pretty different endings, um, I guess. The film ends in a very gentle, big finality moment of you know this is how the story wraps up. Um, kind kind of bittersweet, but you know a f- happy ending for our girls. The book has a really kind of overwhelming, um, kind of ambitious, um, uh, more encompassing ending, I guess. And then the show has like the kind of pause point. Here's a moment of grace, you know, for all our characters in their different moments in time, you know, just take the moments as they come. It's interesting. Same story ends in quite different ways. I wonder how the musical will approach it. Can we get Moffat to write? The music, can we, (laughs) can we use that to do series two? (laughs) Bargaining, bargaining. Uh, did you notice? I think this sums the film's approach to time travel up quite succinctly. Did you notice that every time someone time travels, a couple of notes get played backwards in the soundtrack? Hmm. And there's at one point there's a ticking clock. <laughs> it feels very much to me like <laughs> so. This is time travel, you say? I'll, I'll put some backward notes in. And a ticking clock. It's very much, it's a romance film that happens to have a bit of time travel in it. Um, rather than a time travel film. I, when the, when the show was first announced, I actually thought that Moffat was adapting the film. I didn't know mm. that there was mm. a book. And I really struggled to see what, um, what hidden depths he was going <laughs> to bring out. I was <laughs> I like, that, oh, this yeah. is going to be a radically different story. <laughs> I think. This is actually a really interesting difference between the show and the book. So, the show was made because uh, Moffat had always been interested in the rights uh, and his producer partner, Brian Minchin, you know, eventually said, I'm going to look into these and see if we can finally do it now because Moffat has, you know, always adored the book and, you know, he's looked into the rights before, but the film happened, which complicated things and, you know, the rights had swum around for a while. Uh, But the show is very much Stephen Moffat wants to make The Time Traveler's Wife, HBO, you know, saying, sure, uh, Stephen Moffat's a big name, you know, this is all going to come together. Uh, so, and then the show, you know, show ran, so it's all produced and it's all written entirely by the same one creative voice. So, the show is very much a product of kind of, of single vision that wanted to do an adaptation. The film, uh, you know, the film, the rights, the rights got, <laughs> the rights got optioned before the book came out. I became involved in Time Traveler's Wife when the agent for the book, somebody by the name of Howie Sanders, turned me on to it when it was, I think, in manuscript form. At that time, it was coming out on a smaller, independent-type publisher, and nobody had any expectation that it was going to be a bestseller. But it was a beautifully written book, and it had a very intriguing conceit. That, you know, it's a, it's a very different journey. And then the film went through loads of hands. Uh, Spielberg... And David Fincher uh, were both looking into it at one point. Other directors, Gus Van Sant, there was negotiations with all sorts of people, but it came from a point of, you know, a production company optioning optioning the rights to the book before the book had come out, as sometimes happens. And, you know, we went through a lot of hands, basically. So the film, I'm not saying it wasn't made with love, because I do think in a lot of ways it was, but it wasn't made with kind of a screaming, I have to adapt this, you know, because I love this so much. It was made... It got optioned and then, you know, it went through a, a list of, would he do it? No. Would he do it? Maybe. Would he do it? Yes, but he'd ask for this, which we're not willing to give. You know, would he do it? So, there's a very very different kind of approach to adaptation and to, in, in that regard. And it very much feels like Moffat's adaptation does adore 
the book it's adapting. Um, but more than that, it's just conscious of it. It knows what beats were important in the book and why they were important. And the TV show, the, the film more feels like taking the story in the broad strokes and telling a new story that's the same shape as that story, rather than being about itself in the way that the the TV show is so about the book. I mean, the, the way that each episode of the TV show begins with a, a different riff building up to the front cover of the book, <laughs> yeah. like us- using the in-universe staging to build up to the the actual splash cover title page of the of the book itself yeah it's so adoring of the original text um uh, there's not many people who write like that yeah i think what's interesting here is the film offers a complete interpretation of the book it adapted you know the run of the book we've seen this is the director and the scriptwriter's take on the entire novel uh the show having only adapted half the book through its first season and then getting cancelled, the show is always going to have the question of, well, what would have happened next? How would Moffat's style, you know, his ethos and his themes have been channeled through the rest of the book? Uh, how many more seasons did he want to do? Uh, how, how, how would that have taken shape? Whereas the film, we have, this is the entire idea here. It's interesting, you know, we can talk, us three can talk a lot about Moffat's kind of over... His, his themes over all his work and the connections between all his shows because we have this big sense of his body of work. It was interesting to me, uh, the writer of the film has was kind of saying something similar, saying about he can see all these links between his body of work and just has how in our episode discussions of the show, we were drawing links between Doctor Who and Joking Apart and coupling these sitcoms Moffat has done in his past and we were connecting all his shows together and how they kind of arrived at The Time Traveler's Wife very much as a culmination uh, the film's writer was talking kind of similarly with uh, his career, which I found really interesting. This is what he had to say about the film as a kind of culmination or next step in his body of work. Before Henry dies and after he dies, he's still there. Before he dies, he's already visiting his daughter after he's dead. After he dies, comes back to visit his wife before he dies. I love you, Daddy. I love you too, honey. And it gives some sense that there is a presence that goes beyond death. You know, I play with that a lot in the movie Ghost, and I play with it a little bit in Jacob's Ladder. It's a theme I really care about. I'm going. The great love stories are always stories that are ultimately about loss, about not being able to have forever, in the physical sense, the one you love. And Henry and Claire are not meant to live together in time. I can't stay. I know. And part of the preparation for the greatness of their love story is that they have learned to live together out of time. It's an extraordinary feat. As a writer, I get this enormous joy of knowing I get two hours at any given moment to talk to the world. But I realized early on that each movie is like a sentence, an idea, one idea. And a career, if you're lucky to have a career, is a paragraph. And that's what I want. I want to be able to have one paragraph of understanding that I can share with the world. And all of these films put together, I think, create that paragraph. And Time Traveler's Wife fits into that paradigm perfectly for me. You know, it's not a full 100% statement of what it means to be free of death, but it is a real intimation of love continuing beyond time. And now we can talk forever, you know, what would or w- wouldn't he have done? You know, the the film offers us a big closed point of this is what they did with all the... um. You know, all the meat on the bone of the book. But a kind of upside to something getting cancelled is then you forever get to talk about it. You know, you forever get to say, well, would they have done this or would they have done that? You see shows that kind of live on in cultural memory, I think, are the shows often that do not get to finish. Like Twin Peaks, you know, for over, well, for, you know, 25 years had people still talking rapidly about it. And part of that was because it ended in such a way that you go, well, what happens next? Or, you know, or what does that mean? It doesn't end, you know, and that's how, you know, it wrapped up. And um, yeah, I, I guess that's <laughs> the legacy of the film and the show's difference is the film wraps up in a lovely little bow. The show doesn't wrap up, not out of choice, but, you know, in a way it's a blessing because people will keep talking about it one way or another. And this, friends, is acceptance. We did it. We've <laughs> grieved. <laughs>
<laughs> Maybe it's okay that it didn't get another series. Maybe that's better in our hearts. If the other husband sequel does get adapted, I don't think this would make the novelist happy. And I guess it's up to her because she gets to decide who gets the rights to the second book since they're not connected with the first books. But it would be amazing to see a sequel film uh, with Eric Banner and Rachel McAdams now instead of a (laughs) sequel series with new actors or with the show's actors. True mindfuck mode is you get the movie cast and a Moffat script. No, no, with the soundtrack from the musical. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, great. But yeah, any other thoughts on the movie? Because I'm I'm close to, yeah, wrapping up if you guys... Now, now we're talking about musical uh, sequels where, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good place to end it on. Something I should have said earlier that while I was watching the film, um, since I had made some references to it in uh, the previous episode of this podcast that I was on, um, I was like hypersensitive to see if I got anything wrong because I knew that my memory of it was just a little rusty. And um, I remember that in that previous episode i said that i didn't remember like gomez's character and i was kind of like oh i don't like this character like who's this new guy you know of course i warmed up to him but you know imagine my surprise when i saw him in the dinner scene in the film which is basically the same first interaction of them being super skeptical of henry except then he disappears so i don't really blame myself for (laughs) for getting that that bit right I actually like his casting, but he gets like no scenes uh, in yeah. the film, pretty much. My last stray thought is that it's, it's reminded me really strongly of the Doctor Who TV movie, huh. in that it's an adaptation that doesn't feel like it's quite doing the same thing as the original, and it's trying to be quite a broad film for general audiences and it's basically a romance but it's got weird bits of adaptation stitched through it and the structure's a bit odd and it's timey but only by obligation like it feels like the the mood is you know in the tv movie the 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 and the gramophone gets stuck on the word time (laughs) it's time 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 It feels like that kind of adaptation yeah. to me, where they, we know it's about time travel, so we'll put in the word time a few times. <laughs> to be fair, I quite like the TV movie, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and that concludes our discussion of the Time Traveller's Wife film. Unfortunately, the recent announcement that the TV show has been cancelled means we won't be able to discuss a series two in future like we would have liked to. But we do still have another discussion to come, focusing specifically on the 2003 novel itself, the originator of this whole story. Uh, In the meantime, please let us know what you thought of the 2009 film, whether on its own terms or in comparison to the TV show and or to the novel. And let us know what you thought of what us three had to say about the film as well. We'd love to hear your opinions on any of this stuff. And thank you very much for listening to us have our chat about it. Thanks.